Welcome to Voices in Leadership, live streamed worldwide from the Leadership Studio at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. I'm Dean Michelle Williams. The goal of Voices is to highlight the experiences of leaders confronting major public health frontiers and to better understand effective leadership and how it can affect change. I hope you find this program engaging and informative. Thank you for joining us. Hello, and welcome to those of you here in the studio and to our viewers online around the globe. I'm Eric Anderson, the director of Voices in Leadership. This series focuses on effective leadership to create positive change in public health. We're broadcasting from the Leadership Studio, where the programs and related content have received over 4 million viewer engagements to date and counting. Today, we host a discussion entitled Improving the Public's Health, a conversation about leadership with Dr. Lena Wen. Dr. Lena Wen is an emergency physician, public health leader, and a passionate advocate for patient-centered healthcare reform. The author of the critically acclaimed book, When Doctors Don't Listen, her TED Talk on transparency in medicine has been viewed nearly two million times. In 2019, Dr. Wen was named one of Time's 100 Most Influential People. Currently a visiting professor of health policy and management at the George Washington University School of Public Health, Dr. Wynn is also the Distinguished Fellow at the Fitzhugh Mullen Institute of Health Workforce Equity. Most recently, she was President and CEO of the Planned Parenthood Federation of America, where she led a national healthcare organization with over 600 health centers and a presence in all 50 states. Dr. Wynn also served as the Health Commissioner for the City of Baltimore. Under her direction, the Baltimore City Health Department led the country in health innovations and was recognized by the National Association of County and City Health Officials as the Local Health Department of the Year. Before I turn this discussion over to our moderator, Dr. Lenny Marcus, please join me as we welcome Dr. Lena Wen to the Voices in Leadership series at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Thank you. Well, Lena, it's a thrill having you here. And you know um, you're here as part of our examination and understanding and study of leadership, one of the questions that public health leaders often don't ask themselves is, why do you lead? So I thought we would start off with the question of why, why do you lead and what do you hope to accomplish in your leadership? Well, great first question, <laughs> honey. <laughs> <Tough one. laughs> um, first of all, thank you for the invitation to be here. I've been a big fan and admirer of your work in leadership and also really thanks to all of you for, for, for coming today. It's nice to be back in Boston too. This is where I trained um, for my emergency medicine residency at Brigham and Mass General, so it's nice to be back. You know, I actually don't know that I ever thought about my work as leadership. Mm. I th just think of it as getting things done. And when I look back and look at the titles I've had or the things that I've done in these titles, it's always because there was something that nobody else was doing. And it was my opportunity to step up and do that. And if it's anything that's driven me throughout my life, it's not the idea of leadership, but rather the idea of access to care. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I'm an immigrant. I came to, to the US with my parents just before I turned eight. And growing up, my parents and I depended on Medicaid and food stamps. Um, my mother, when she was pregnant with my sister, um, was on WIC um, for food and nutrition. And I think, you know, growing up the way that we did, sometimes experiencing homelessness and depending on public services, which, by the way, for us, were not entitlements. They were what allowed us to literally survive. But I think growing up as I did, I saw what happens when people don't have access to the basic right of health care. And that's what drove me initially to become an emergency physician, mm -hmm. really because I didn't want to turn patients away. This is before the Affordable Care Act, and mm -hmm. I never wanted to be the doctor who would turn away patients because of their immigration status, because of their ability to pay, because of what insurance they had. And yet it's also in the ER that I saw that it's not enough to just provide care if my patients are being prevented from getting the care because of some policy that was in place. I mean, I remember this one patient I had who told me about how glad she was the day that she got on dialysis. And the reason was 
Before that, she had pre-existing conditions, right, which all of us have, but she had high blood pressure, diabetes, and couldn't afford her medications because she couldn't afford health insurance because she was priced out of it. Mm -hmm. And the day that she got Medicaid, or sorry, the day that she got on dialysis was mm -hmm. the day that she qualified for Medicaid. And she told me how thankful she was that she could finally get the health care that she needs mm -hmm. to survive. Mm -hmm. But how perverse is our system that in order to get good care, that you have to show that you're really ill first. And now she's tethered to a machine three times a week and can't work and take care of her kids. And I think it's from that realization that I got to the point of saying, look, just providing medical care isn't enough. I also have to be fighting for my patients to mm -hmm. literally access that care. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's a long-winded answer to your question of why lead? Mm -hmm. Because for me, it's not about leading for the sake of leadership or leading to have a particular goal, it was always because something needed to be done. And my North Star has always been the patients and the people that I serve. Mm -hmm. you know, one, I'm a great admirer of your leadership. And one of the things I've um, noticed about you as a public health leader is you have an extraordinary imagination. Um, you can see possibilities that other people can't even imagine as, as thinkable. And you can also understand problems in ways that uh, people can understand just what it means for different people to cope with those problems. W where does your imagination come from? And then how does your imagination influence your leadership? Well, I appreciate your kind words. <laughs> Though I, <laughs> They're sincere. <laughs> Though I, but I also think that the imagination comes directly from my clinical work, mm -hmm. which is what drives me. And I'm so proud to still be, to have been this entire time, to have been practicing clinical medicine because that's what grounds me. Um, we did a lot in Baltimore um, when I was the health commissioner there around a, a number of issues, including the opioid epidemic, maternal and child health, gun violence, all of which we conceptualized as public health issues. And people might look at the programs now and say, oh, that was an innovative, creative solution. But that solution came about because of the patients that I saw. So I'll, I'll give you an example of this. When I first came to Baltimore in 2014, we were facing the escalation of the opioid epidemic and people were dying at record numbers. The number of people dying from fentanyl was tripling, quadrupling. Um, it was really frightening to see the trends that were happening. But I also thought, look, in the ER, I've given the opioid antidote, naloxone or Narcan, to dozens if not hundreds of people before. And that's a solution that if we can somehow get the antidote into people's hands, I mean, if this were any other public health crisis and there's an antidote available, wouldn't you want to get that into as many people's hands as possible? And so we got legislation changed so that I issued a blanket prescription for naloxone to every single one of our 620,000 residents in our city. Now, it's unconventional because, and actually kind of scary, because as much as I knew that it was the right thing to do, writing your NPI number and signature on 620,000 prescriptions is still a little bit scary. Right. right? And um, unusual. <laughs> and unusual. <laughs> um, although now, it's actually quite standard across the country. But at the time, people, the types of things that we encountered included huge prejudice and stigma. People saying things like, well, wouldn't, just, wouldn't that make people use more drugs? to which we would say, but we don't deny people cardiac medications or blood pressure medications because it might make them eat more foods, more bad foods. I mean, we just don't say that for any other illness. And um, as a result of the blanket prescription and as a result of the outreach that we did as well, everyday residents in our city saved nearly 3,000 lives in three years of their family members, friends, and community members. And so I give this example because I think you know, we didn't come into this work, my team and I, we didn't come into this work saying, we're going to do something innovative and creative and imaginative. Right, right. But rather we said, here is the problem in front of us. What are the solutions that we have? And one reason I loved my job in Baltimore and in so many ways it was my dream job is that it had the, we had the opportunity to influence policy, right. but we also recognized that policy alone is not enough unless we also provide services to meet people where they are. Mm. And it was the opportunity to combine the policy and the implementation together with the advocacy 
that was so powerful and I think is an additional opportunity to leverage that imagination directly to translate into progress for people. You know, w w one of the um, the tenets of what we call meta leadership, that you know, getting that big uh, understanding of problems and and solutions, is influence beyond authority. And you know, that is one of the realities of public health leadership that we don't have a lot of authority, and yet we can exert influence. So, how in that example were you able to pull so many people on board with you to be able to do something at the time that was really imaginative, imaginative, and, and cutting edge? Actually, had we started in a different way, we probably wouldn't have gotten the stakeholders that we needed on board. Okay. And here's what I mean. At that time, and we're talking 2014, 2015, a different era when it comes to addiction policy, because thankfully, this is one of the issues where we've seen this tide um, of, of opinion change in this period of time, in the last five years, that now I think there is broad understanding that addiction is a disease and that treating it like a moral failing is ineffective, unscientific, and immoral. But at that time, there was a lot, we got a lot of pushback, especially when it came to NIMBYism, the not in my backyard. It was so bad in Baltimore that one of our community leaders termed it banana. Don't build anything near anything that's near anything. <laughs> <laughs> and. I think had we started and said the problem, it, it is, this is actually the problem, if the problem is that we don't have enough addiction treatment, if we started at that point, the community would not have been behind us because people were watching out for their own self-interest in a way that I also do understand. I mean, business owners, residents were saying, well, we don't want another treatment center. So if I'd come in as the new health commissioner and said, my goal is to get to treatment on demand, which is the goal, and we have to treat addiction as a disease and look across the country, only one in 10 people with a disease of addiction are able to get the help that they need. I mean, these are all true statements, right. but if we had started at that point, because it's not meeting people where they are at that moment, we would have encountered all kinds of resistance from the very communities that we needed their input and their buy-in. So instead of starting there, we said, look, who could argue that if somebody is dying in front of you right now, it's our prerogative to save their life? And by the way, Baltimore has had a long history of harm reduction programs. We were one of the first jurisdictions to start needle exchange 25 years ago. And because of needle exchange, the percentage of people with HIV from IV drug use decreased from 63% to 7% in 15 years. I mean, there's a long history of that type of approach. And so we started with the harm reduction naloxone, save your life right now. Once we were able to show the success of this program, once we had hundreds, then thousands of people whose lives were saved, whose family members can attest to what it meant for them, then we were able to get to treatment. The treatment part took much longer, and it still is a work in progress. But in that same period of time, because of the naloxone work, we were able to get the public to be mobilized and energized for people to realize this is not someone else's problem. These individuals who have the disease of addiction, they are our family members, our friends, our neighbors. They're, they are people whose lives are, whose lives are impacted right now. And because of our naloxone work, we then got to starting a stabilization center, which is the first of its kind in Maryland and one of the first in the country. That's a 24 seven ER for addiction and mental health. We got the majority of our hospitals on board with treating addiction and, um, and doing things like having peer outreach workers working in the ERs and I mean, a number of other innovative programs, but only because of that initial outreach. And I think just one more point on the yeah. how to mobilize um, and, and the influence beyond authority. Mm -hmm. You know, it's been said in public health that there is no face of public health. And actually, when public health succeeds, it's often when we are invisible, right? There is, when we do successful investigations of outbreaks and when we protect um, f people from foodborne illness, there isn't an outbreak, there isn't a foodborne illness. And so there, I think the, that's great. The only problem though is that if public health is invisible, if there's no face of public health, then who is going to make the case for it? And my argument is that we have to make 
the invisible visible. Because otherwise, public health is going to be the first thing on the chopping block. I mean, we are the ones who know, as public health practitioners, how public health is actually integral to everything else, how it ties to education, how it ties to income inequality, how it ties to transportation and violence and, and vice versa, though all these other issues very integrally influence people's health too. We have to be the chief evangelists for our work. And to say, as my longtime mentor and, um, and, and hero would say, Congressman Elijah Cummings would say, that the cost of doing nothing isn't nothing. The cost of doing nothing isn't nothing because there is the cost of inaction. And we are the ones who have to make the case forcefully for our work through example, through influence, through demonstration of successes, and critically through what happens if we don't act. You know, one of the um, audiences for your public health messaging has been the political landscape. Um, we're, of course, in a very politically charged uh, year mm -hmm. uh, without getting into candidates or specific um, the specifics of this year. Um, how should public health be speaking with political leaders and how do we advocate exactly what you've been talking about at a time that's politically charged that could be an opportunity uh, for, for public health? Three things. Yeah. Um, only because I think in three, so I can only think of two at the moment, but I'll think of the third by the time I get to it. <laughs> Eventually it'll come. Um, the first is no. we need to meet people where they are. Right. That's a core principle of public health, and I think it applies in politics as it does to any other stakeholder community. If we start from where we are and start talking about social determinants, we may agree that this is important, but if this is not the language that somebody else cares about, they're not going to listen. And we can't make them listen. But so let's talk about local elections. Probably in every jurisdiction, what people care about will be some combination of cr um, crime and public safety, jobs, education, housing, right? I mean, these are kind of bread and butter um, um, local issues and national issues too. If we know that a certain candidate cares about these issues, or, or let's say that their one platform is education, then it's up to us to make the case for why public health is important to education, which, if, for example, in Baltimore, we did a number of things related to this, related to education. We, got, we started a program called Vision for Baltimore that provided glasses free of charge to every student in public schools in, um, right in their schools without them having to miss school, without the parents having to miss work. Now, I'm all about doing studies, and I think sitting in the School of Public Health here, I should be all for research. Right. But I don't need another study to tell me that if kids can't see, they can't read. And that's a pretty intuitive thing to link education and health. So, if, so that's an example of how you know, we, we can make the case for the other person. If their platform is about education, we need to be saying, here's why you should care about, about health. So, um, so tailor the message to, to, to that person. Mm -hmm. The second thing is incremental progress is okay, and not only is it okay, it's important. So much of the work in public health is long-term, and our results are measured in many years later. I mean, if we're measuring life expectancy and increases in life expectancy, it's gonna take a long time for us to show the fruits of our work. But especially for the political arena, they can't work in these long-term, we can't just talk about long-term successes. Mm -hmm. We also have to demonstrate short-term actions too. And I think it is important for us to show these incremental changes along the way and to also recognize, as we saw on the local level, that incremental change means that it helps that person in that moment. For the patient who is overdosing right now, Yes, naloxone is not the long-term solution, but frankly, you cannot have a better tomorrow if you're not alive today. And so incremental progress is, even though it's not the sexiest, even though it's not overall overhauling ideology, at the same time, it's important to show that progress along the way. And now I, I can think of number three. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> which is to always be anchored to our North Star. Now, for me, my North Star has always been clear because I'm always, first and foremost, a clinician. 
and my North Star is my patients. It's improving health for my patients and reducing disparities for the communities that I serve. I think as a result of that, my work and our work, whatever organization that I'm with in Baltimore or others, has a level of clarity. Because so often there are arguments and politics that get into the, the what, right? The, the talking point, the strategies. And for me, I don't see that because it's not what we're fighting about, but who we're fighting for. You know, as a student of public health leaders, um, we've had over the years some, uh, so, some, some people who've been a real voice for public health and, uh, and they've had a huge impact. And then the, our, our public is just very uninformed about you know, really, really important public health issues. And then people will go off and make their own decisions or science is lost or a uh, rational perspective is lost. So the notion of having a really strong voice for public health, when you look at the American public, especially now in an election year, what do people need to hear? Or how do we reach out to the public so they begin to understand these important public health issues, such as gun violence or vaccinations or other issues, um, through you know more informed uh, by the prism through which we try and understand these very same problems. I do think it's important for us to capitalize on the crises <laughs> at hand, right. of which you're also a an expert in right. crisis leadership. But the idea that I think it was Rahm Emanuel, don't don't let a good crisis go yes, to waste. Right, right, right. I think is important. I mean, now that there is, now that vaccine denial is in the news, it is important for us to really emphasize why this is the case. I mean, now that there are real cases of measles all around the country and around the world, we can talk again about why vaccines are safe, effective, and life-saving. Um, actually, it was when we had a suspected case of measles in Baltimore that we were able to substantially increase our vaccination rates too, because that provided this, this important opportunity. So capitalizing on the crises, if you will, and taking advantage of those moments to elevate the voice of public health is critical. But I also think that our responsibility has to extend beyond that. Because again, if we don't make the case for public health, nobody else is going to. One of my greatest frustrations working in public health has been that, has been every time around budget, around the time of the budget, because our successful programs, no matter how much data we have behind them, always either don't get funded or don't get funded enough. There is a program in Baltimore, for example, called Be More for Healthy Babies that is a public-private collaboration involving over 150 partners yeah. that has one goal, a single goal, which is to reduce infant mortality. And within seven years of this program that involves home visiting and um, breastfeeding support, even doulas and a number of other community-based education and parental supports, as a result of this, the infant mortality in our city dropped by 38% in seven years. And we also closed the disparity gap between black and white infant mortality by over 50%. I mean, it's a remarkable program. And I think, you know, I have a two-year-old and I'm expecting, as you can see, my second child now. And I just, you know, it's every parent's worst nightmare to think about their baby, their child dying. And for us to have, basically, the, that percentage is equivalent to 50 babies that would have died in 2009 who would be able to survive now. And I think about how effective this program is and how, I mean, how emotional, the, the emotional draw of this program, it's easy to explain. I mean, people understand being more for healthy babies. And yet, every year when I was the commissioner, this program came within, you know, days of not receiving funding. We had to pull funding from many other sources just, in, just to cover this program. We have, thankfully, a number of very generous philanthropies in the city that, have, that continue to step in when government does not. But then I also think about if we were not trying to close funding gaps all the time, what more could we do? Instead of just maintaining the program at the current level, what more can we do? And it's not just about data, because we have the data to show how effective this program is. And I think it just reminds me of something that, um, that Senator Mikulski, Senator Bar Barbara Mikulski always liked to say, 
which is about how you can't just use data because data are important to provide context, but it's stories that compel action. And that's the work that's cut out for us in public health, that yes, we have to capitalize on the crises when they occur, but we also critically have to focus on how do we get out the broader message by meeting people where they are and talking about these issues in a way that the public really understands. You know, you've answered the question through all of this conversation of why do you lead in public health? And in many ways, your answer has been because you're passionate about all of these issues. How do we give other people that passion for these very same issues, elected officials, uh, the public, so that our country is really oriented towards uh, its own public health and we can really make a difference as leaders? I think that people are there. It's just up to us to make the connection for them. I mean, we can't get through one presidential debate without people talking for quite a long time about Medicare for all, which, you know, I think it's an important conversation for us to have. But frankly, I think we're missing the point. And the point is we need universal, affordable, quality health care for everyone. Medicare for all, as you know, is one way to get there. But let's talk about the goal here. And then I would love to hear candidates go one step further and talk about prevention. I want someone to say, well, let's talk about how to keep people healthy in the first place. Let's talk about keeping lead out of drinking water. Let's talk about how transportation and safe walking spaces are important for health. Let's talk about affordable food. Let's talk about income inequality and how the currency of inequality actually equals years of life in so many communities around the country. I mean, I think our candidates are there. They're talking about all these issues. Our community members are all there too. It's up to us now to make the connection for them and get them inspired and passionate and to speak on our issues and importantly, to fund our policy priorities the way that they really need to. Lita, I want to thank you uh, for being here. This has been an incredible opportunity for us um, to learn from your experiences in leadership. And more importantly, I want to thank you for being a voice for public health. Um, I think you've helped many, many people who didn't understand that they were public health leaders themselves to become advocates for public health and the work that you have done in Baltimore and that the work that you're doing uh, nationally now and, and a very, very important voice for all that we stand for here at the school and for what we stand for in public health. I really appreciate it, Lenny. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you all. Okay. Yeah.